Hi everyone, it's Professor Primpton. In this video, we're going to talk about how to find the absolute maximum and minimum of a function. One of the most important applications of finding the derivative is to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum value. So here's one example where finding the absolute maximum and absolute minimum is very important. Say you have an economist that may be interested in finding the price or production level of a commodity that will bring a maximum profit. A doctor may be interested in the time for a drug to reach its maximum concentration in the bloodstream after an injection, or even a city planner might be interested in the location of a heavy industry in order to produce minimum pollution in residential and business areas. In this section, we're going to develop a method that's going to be able to help us find the absolute maximum and an absolute minimum of a function. In this video, we're going to talk about how to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of a function on an closed interval. So absolute maximum and absolute minimum. Recall that f of c is a y value. It's the local maximum if all the other y values are less than or equal to f of c for each x value that's near x equals c. And a local minimum is where all the y values are greater than or equal to f of c for each x value that's near x equals c. So in other words, it's the lowest y value to be the local minimum when x values are near x equals c, and the local maximum is the largest y value when the x values are close to x equals c. In this section, we'll be interested in finding what is the largest or the smallest values of the function throughout its entire domain, not just x values that are near x equals c, but the entire domain. So absolute maximum and absolute minimum of a function. In the following definitions, c is a value in a given interval. A function f of x has an absolute maximum at x equals c if f of c is greater than or equal to f of x for all x values in the given interval. And a function f of x has an absolute minimum at x equals c if f of c is less than or equal to f of x for all x values in a given interval. A function f of x that has an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum has an absolute extremum at x equals c. In other words, you can think of it in terms of a graph. A point that is an absolute maximum is the highest point on the graph, and the absolute minimum will be the lowest point on the entire graph. So a few examples. If h of x represents the height of Earth above sea level, at a location x, then we have the following for the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum. The absolute maximum of the function would be h of, the location would be the summit of Mount Everest, the height would be 29,028 feet. That's the highest point on Earth above sea level, and so that's the absolute maximum. On the other hand, a local maximum for the function would be the height of the summit of Denali. The summit of Denali is the highest point in North America at 20,310 feet but it's not the highest point on Earth above sea level. That is Mount Everest. So the summit of Denali is only a local maximum. And a local minimum for the height function for the United States would be the height at Death Valley. It's negative 282 feet. So it's 282 feet below sea level. So notice that the local minimum is only talking about the United States and not the entire world. If you're talking about the minimum height for the entire world, then it would be the absolute minimum. Let's try an example of finding the absolute maximum and absolute minimum from a table of values. So example one, absolute maximum and absolute minimum of a function. The table shows the annual calculus enrollments at a large university. What were the absolute maximum and minimum enrollments in calculus at the university? So you have the years from 2000 to 2010, and you have the enrollments in calculus at the large university. Notice that the absolute maximum enrollment occurred in the year 2007, and the enrollment was 1,582 students in calculus. The absolute minimum enrollment was 1,324 students, and it occurred in the year 2001. So that's how you find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum for a table of values. Now we're going to shift our attention to how do you find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum with a graph. The graph of the function given below has both local maxima and local minima, but also an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum for the function labeled on the graph. So notice you have a local minimum at this point because it's the lowest point when x values are near this local minimum at x equals c, but it's not the lowest y value for the entire graph. You have a local minimum and an absolute minimum at this point. It's the lowest y value when x values are near this local minimum, but it's also the lowest y value for the entire graph. So that's called the absolute minimum. On the other hand, you have a local maximum at this point because it forms a hill. All the y values that are near this local maximum will be below it, but it's not the absolute maximum. The absolute maximum occurs at this hill where you have an absolute and a local maximum. It's the largest y value for the entire graph. So note, on the above graph, we see that the absolute extremum can also be a local extremum. So an absolute maximum is also a local maximum because it is the largest y value when x values are near that local maximum. 
and an absolute minimum is also a local minimum because it's the lowest y value when x values are near that local minimum. But on the other hand, just because you have a local max or a local min doesn't make it an absolute max or an absolute min. So now we're going to take a closer look at various intervals of a graph and identify the local extrema and the absolute extrema, if any exist. In the next example, we're going to determine under what conditions does a function have both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. So for this first graph, notice that the interval is the closed interval from negative 3 to 3. So since we're interested in only this closed interval between negative 3 and 3 for the x values, notice that the graph will be in bold between x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 3. We can ignore the part that where x is less than negative 3 and where x is greater than 3. So notice on this closed interval, the graph has an absolute maximum because this is the largest y value for the entire graph, which is also a local maximum. And you also have an absolute minimum at this point because it's the lowest y value for the entire graph. And it's also a local minimum. The absolute maximum for the graph is y equals 3, and it occurs when x equals 2. The absolute minimum is y equals negative 3, and it occurs when x equals negative 2. Now let's move over to the next graph. This graph is on the closed interval between x equals negative 4 and x equals 0. So notice we're looking at a different part of the graph, so our absolute maximum and absolute minimum may change. So we're only interested in this part of the graph. When x equals negative 4 is where the graph starts, and x equals 0 is where the graph stops. Notice that the absolute maximum occurs at the endpoint x equals negative 4. It's the largest y value on the entire graph, and the y value is 3. So the absolute maximum is 3, and it occurs when x equals negative 4. Now notice, just because the absolute maximum is at an endpoint doesn't mean the absolute minimum will be at an endpoint as well. The absolute minimum is still the same. The absolute minimum occurs when x equals negative 2, and the absolute minimum is y equals negative 3. Now let's take a look at this last graph. We're looking at the closed interval from negative 4.2 to positive 4.2. So we're looking at the entire graph, essentially. So notice on this interval, the absolute maximum occurs at the left endpoint when x equals negative 4.2, and it looks like the y values are about 4. So that's the absolute maximum value. And then we have an absolute minimum at the other endpoint, which occurred at x equals 4.2, and the y value is about negative 4. And so keep in mind, the absolute maximum is also a local maximum, and the absolute minimum is also a local minimum. But we also have a local maximum and a local minimum that are not at the endpoints. We have a local minimum when x equals negative 2, the y value is negative 3. And we also have a local maximum when x equals positive 2, the y value is positive 3. But those are not the absolute max or the absolute min because they're not the highest y value or the lowest y value for the entire graph. So each of these three graphs had an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. But where did the absolute maximum and absolute minimum occur? On the first graph, the absolute maximum was at x equals 2 and the absolute minimum was at x equals negative 2. It did not occur at the endpoints. The second graph, we had an absolute maximum at an endpoint and we had an absolute minimum between the endpoints. And the last graph, we had an absolute maximum at the endpoint on the left and we had an absolute minimum at the endpoint on the right. So what does this tell you? It tells you that the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum could occur at an endpoint on the closed interval that we're given, or it may occur when the slope of the tangent line is zero. So notice you have a slope of the tangent line here that is zero, and zero here. Those were not endpoints. Those are where the slope of the tangent line was zero, which we know are the critical numbers for a function. So let's summarize. The only places where a function can have an absolute extremum are the critical numbers for the function or the endpoints on a closed interval. If there are endpoints, we could have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum by comparing the y values at all the critical numbers and at the endpoints. So whenever you're in doubt, the graph of the function can be used to find out the absolute maximum and absolute minimum. The following theorem asserts that a function, which is continuous, at every point on a closed interval, a to b, x equals a to x equals b, has an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum value on that interval. And this theorem is called the extreme value theorem, which says a function f of x that is continuous on a closed interval starting at x equals a and ending at x equals b has both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on that interval. It doesn't tell us how to find the absolute maximum or absolute minimum. It just tells us that we do have an absolute maximum and absolute minimum on that closed interval. So let's take a look at the graphs that are in this next example. Example two, finding the absolute extrema from a graph. Analyze the graphs given below and find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum provided that any exist. So notice in this first graph, the graph continues to the left indefinitely because of the arrow, and the graph stops at x equals one on the right because the graph does not continue any further than that. Notice that there is no absolute maximum because this graph will continue going up as you go to the left forever. So there is no largest y value for the graph. 
but there is an absolute minimum. There's an absolute minimum which is occurring when you're on the x-axis. So the absolute minimum is y equals 0, and it occurs when x equals negative 3. So this was a half open or a half closed interval. The graph continued to the left indefinitely, so this was negative infinity for the domain, and the graph stopped at x equals 1. So that's one closed bracket. So this graph had an absolute minimum, but no absolute maximum. Since we did not have a closed interval, we could not guarantee that we had both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. We only had a half open or half closed interval. Let's take a look at this next graph. This graph looks like the graph is continuing to the left and down forever, and it's continuing to the right and down forever. So you have an open interval from negative infinity to infinity. Notice that the absolute maximum is y equals 2, and it occurs when x equals 4. That's the largest y value for the entire graph, but there is no smallest y value because the graph continues down to the left and as you go to the right as well. So there is no absolute minimum for this graph. So again, the extreme value theorem said you can only have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum guaranteed if it's a closed interval. And since this is an open interval, we're not guaranteed to have either absolute max or an absolute min. So there's no absolute min here, but there was an absolute maximum. So let's take a look at this third graph. It looks like the graph starts on the left when x equals negative 3.5 or negative 7 halves, and the graph stops when you go to the right at x equals 3, but the point is not included. So again, we have a half open, half closed interval from negative 3.5 or negative 7 halves, but including the point, so you use a square bracket, and you go to the right no further than x equals 3, but it's not included, so use a parenthesis. Notice in this graph you have an absolute minimum that occurs at an endpoint, y equals negative 5, and it occurs at x equals negative 3.5, but you do not have an absolute maximum because the point is not included as part of the domain for this function. You would have an absolute maximum at x equals 3, but since x equals 3 is not part of the domain, there is no absolute maximum for this graph. And then this last graph is very similar. The graph starts whenever x is about negative 0.5, but the point is not included, and the graph will continue to the right and up forever because of the error on the end. So again, we have an interval from negative 0.5 to infinity. So let's see if we can find an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum value. We have no absolute minimum because the point is not included as part of the domain for this function. We would have an absolute minimum if this point was filled in, and the absolute minimum would occur whenever x is negative 0.5. But the point's not included, so no absolute minimum. And the graph will continue to the right and up, so there is no absolute maximum either. There is no highest y value for the entire graph. So in all four of these previous cases in the graphs, we notice that the absolute maximum or an absolute minimum could occur at a critical number, or it could occur at an endpoint. The only way that we are guaranteed to have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum is that you have a closed interval. And the absolute maximum and absolute minimum are unique y values, but they may occur more than once within that interval. So now that we've talked about how to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum using a table of values, and also looking at the graph of the function, let's look at example three. We're going to use the extreme value theorem. Find the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum values of the function f of x equals x cubed, subtract 3x squared, subtract 9x plus 5, on the interval negative 2 less than or equal to x less than or equal to 6. So this is a closed interval. The x values are no smaller than negative 2, and it's included, and the x values are no larger than 6, and you do include x equals 6 as a possibility. So the endpoints are included as part of this interval, so it's a closed interval. Since the absolute maximum or an absolute minimum could occur at a critical point or at the endpoints, check the y values at the endpoints. So we have an endpoint at x equals negative 2, and you have an endpoint at x equals 6. Substitute these values into the original function to find out what are the y values for the function at the endpoints. So whenever x equals negative 2, you have f of negative 2 would be negative 2 cubed, subtract 3 times negative 2 squared, subtract 9 times negative 2 plus 5 after replacing all the x's with negative 2. And if you simplify, you get 3. Now that doesn't mean it's an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum. You have to compare the y values. The other endpoint was x equals 6. If you plug 6 into the function for all the x values, you have f of 6 is 6 cubed, subtract 3 times 6 squared, subtract 9 times 6 plus 5, you get 59. So you might be thinking this might be the absolute maximum of the function, but we can't tell if this is the absolute maximum until we find all the critical numbers, because the critical number may also produce an absolute maximum value. In other words, the top of the graph may be even larger than 59. So now we find the critical numbers of the function f of x, by calculating the derivative f prime of x and determining what are the x values where the derivative is zero or undefined. So since f of x was a polynomial, the derivative is the derivative of each term separately using the power rule and the sum of difference rules, the derivative f prime of x will be 3x squared 
subtract 6x, subtract 9. Now where is this derivative undefined? It's a polynomial. So f prime of x is undefined, never occurs. Or the derivative could be 0, which means you may have a slope of the tangent line being 0. So if f prime of x equals 0, that means take the derivative and set it equal to 0 and solve for x. So 3x squared subtract 6x subtract 9 equals 0. Let's solve by factoring. So notice that all the terms have a 3 in common, so factor it out as the greatest common factor. So you have 3, and then first term you have an x squared left, you have a negative 2x from the second term, and a minus 3 from the third term, and this all equals 0. So now let's see if the trinomial factor is what's left over in the parentheses. You have a 3 on the outside, two numbers are multiplied to negative 3, and the same two numbers add to negative 2 will be negative 3 and positive 1. So 3 times x minus 3 is one factor, and x plus 1 is the other factor, and this all equals 0. So now that you have the left side of the equation factored, one of these factors must be 0. Well, 3 can't be 0, so ignore it. x minus 3 equals 0 gives you x equals 3, and x plus 1 equals 0 gives you x equals negative 1. These are critical numbers because that's where the derivative is equal to 0. So you have a slope of the tangent line is 0 at x equals 3 and x equals negative 1. Now let's find out what are the y values at these two critical numbers. Plug x equals negative 1 into the original function to find the y value. If you plug in x equals negative 1 into the derivative, it will be 0. That's why we found x equals negative 1 was a critical number. So if you plug negative 1 into the original function, you'll have negative 1 cubed, subtract 3 times negative 1 squared, subtract 9 times negative 1 plus 5, you get 10. And so the other critical number was x equals 3. If you plug this into the original function, you have f of 3 is 3 cubed, subtract 3 times 3 squared, subtract 9 times 3 plus 5. That gives you negative 22. So now let's compare all the y values with the endpoints and the critical numbers. The largest y value for the entire graph on this closed interval occurred when the y value was 59. That's the largest y value for the entire graph on this closed interval. And it occurred when x equals 6. So that's the absolute maximum. The absolute minimum value did not occur at an endpoint. It occurred at a critical number. Notice that this critical number, x equals 3, it was the smallest y value that we obtained between the critical numbers and the endpoints. And so the absolute minimum occurs at a critical point. The y value was negative 22 when x was equal to 3, and that was a critical number. So what this example shows is that if you want to find the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum on a closed interval, you have to first consider the endpoints as where an absolute maximum or absolute minimum occurs, or an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum could occur at a critical point. So you have to find the critical numbers for the function as well. And then you compare all the y values for the endpoints and the critical numbers. So this is a good place to stop our video. Now that we've talked about how to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of a function using the table values, a graph, and also how to use the extreme value theorem to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum for a function on a closed interval. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about how to find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum on an open interval.